We're running a bit late, but I'm going to assume I have one and a half hours, as was originally scheduled, so we'll be going from now until 1.30. Let me, before introducing the panel, um, just, I'm glad that Dr. Maqdisi ended on the regional context a little bit by putting the Tunisian experience very much up to date on where it is now, and I'm, I'm glad we're going to get to hear a little bit more this evening. But perhaps just to be a little bit more precise about what is going on at the regional level, you might have heard that uh, several countries across the region in North Africa and the Middle East um, are seeking to appease popular discontent, uh, a combination of tax breaks and subsidies. Algeria is making moves to fix food prices. Libya has scrapped customs and taxes on essential food commodities. Saudi Arabia is developing a food reserve strategy. Jordan has earmarked 28 plus million dollars to support essential commodities. Syria has restored heating fuel subsidies and unveiled a 225 million social assistance fund, although they have been working on that for over a year, um, I know for a fact. From what we've heard just before, none of these are going to go to the root of the problem. Um, we're talking about more pacification and perhaps a little bit more of the short-term fixes um, that have become unfortunately too common in our recent economic and policy response history. Um, also to set the tone for this discussion and continuing very much from the diagnostic of the previous, the issues of governance and employment are what we're looking at. Um, as uh, Rahim uh, Awad ended up saying, um, although Arab figures for youth unemployment are higher, there's nothing unique about them in the global context. There are many different reasons for the unemployment within the region. We're talking about a genuine lack of aggregate demand, labor demand in non-oil countries. And then this use of cheap foreign labor in the oil exporters and some others. And, and I hope that some of the speakers will come back to that. We talked about a number of causes, again, just to set the scene for this discussion. Um, causes at the macro level, industrial, trade, and business, all basically implying policies that constrain the overall level of employment, in addition to labor policies that are neither well designed or targeted, or evaluated by the way, which is something that we certainly try to do. Um, a quality of job in general that is not acceptable to an increasingly educated and aspiring middle class. Um, and issues, of course, in the quality and relevance of human resource development, including education and training. All this against the backdrop of constrained labor markets that are also very segmented, and all of the presentations refer to the divide between public and private sector, between male and female, um, and I think the other thing which is implied, certainly um, extreme degrees of relying on national versus migrant labor. Another big, I think, um, attribute. Um, this leads to, I think, the two other themes that I wish to underscore, the issue of inclusion, and this came out again in the previous set of presentations. Um, the most marginalized are never part of the conversations or the diagnostic, and certainly not the policy setting, whichever way we choose to do it, and the issue of social protection uh, more clearly. Uh, this is also the region that has the lowest rates of social protection across the board, and I'm not just talking about unemployment benefit or maternity benefit, but also social security um, in all of its forms, including health and some of the demands, um, particularly in the streets of uh, Cairo these days, um, revolve exactly around these issues. With that, um, I am pleased to uh, welcome our four panelists that, who will be discussing um, Yemen. We have Justin Sykes, um, who works with the uh, regional youth employment initiative Silatec, based in Doha. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim Saif, who comes from the Economic and Social Council of Jordan, uh, the very latest uh, innovation uh, in public policy response, I think, uh, certainly in this part of, of the Arab world. Uh, Nader Abbani from the Syria Trust for Development, and Hanna Al Ghali, Program Coordinator from the Institute for International Studies and Education, University of Pittsburgh. Um, I'd like to ask the speakers to stick to 15 minutes or slightly less, please, so that we can have some time for discussion. Justin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Nada. Uh, could I have the PowerPoint set up? Um, 
I would have liked a Yemeni to be in my position, um, but I've been jokingly offered honorary citizenship a few times, so uh, hopefully I'll do my honorary com compatriots justice. Uh, uh, I come from Silatech, um, as Nada mentioned, a regional initiative for youth employment. Um, I wear two hats. I work uh, within the knowledge and policy uh, team at Silatech, and also uh, I'm uh, working on uh, programming and leading out our programming in Yemen. So hopefully I give a bit of a mixed flavor in terms of some policy issues, but also some practical programming uh, information as well. So, uh, Talking of Yemen, um, Yemen is, is a challenging country. Um, it's the poorest country in the Middle East and North Africa region. Um, it has the low, some of the lowest social development indicators of all the countries in the region. Um, in terms of youth, uh, nearly 70% uh, of the population are under the age of 25. The mean age of the country is only 17 and uh, young people represent 50% uh, of the working age population. In terms of the wider uh, socio-political landscape, as you well know from the media, the country is facing three conflicts, uh, the Al-Houthi rebellion in the north, the uh, Harak uh, southern movement, and then uh, uh, instability through uh, fundamentalist groups in the central areas of the country. Uh, it's facing the highest levels of urbanization in the region um, due to population growth and there's growing water scarcity. So um, there's a, a um, potent mix of challenges that the country is facing. Uh, in terms of unemployment, uh, as mirrors uh, the presentations this morning, we have a similar situation where we have a, a public unemployment rate uh, of around 15% uh, for, for the overall population and 25% for, uh, for young people. Uh, but that public unemployment rate disguises um, realities on the ground and unofficial unemployment rates um, are at least 10 to 15% to higher both to the general population and the youth population. As other, as other presenta uh, presentations mentioned, um, these figures in themselves disguise uh, regional, uh, gender, and educational disparities. So if we look, for example, uh, in the, the south of the country around Aden, uh, youth unemployment is, is around 50%. Um, young women uh, are discriminated in the labor market and face employment rates double uh, that of young men. And then, as was mentioned previously, if we have a mix of education and gender, uh, we, we see young women uh, graduates having some of the highest unemployment rates in the country, up, up, up at around 60 to 70 percent. Um, all this should be uh, taken in the context of unemployment being an elastic concept in Yemen, um, where very few Yemenis can afford to be openly unemployed, and the majority of young people are working uh, in irregular, informal and part-time employment just to, to survive. Um, when we, look, when we talk about the root causes of employment, we see four key areas of, uh, four key issues. One is, is what, we, what we call daunting demographics. Um, Yemen has the world's highest population growth at uh, 3%. The population of Yemen is set to double uh, from 22 million to over 40 million by 2030. And we have 200,000 young people entering the labor market annually at the moment, and that's set to rise. Uh, a World Bank study um, has suggested that the country needs to create 2 million new jobs uh, by 2020 just to maintain current levels of unemployment. And clearly, um, job creation as it's currently structured in the country is going to be unable to keep up with a number of labor market entrants. Um, we, we have a uh, stagnant, uh, or we have a, a, a slow move. Great. I think we're back in action. Sorry about that. Uh, so... Um, We've got a turgid labor, mar labor market in terms of weak job placement and job matching services. Uh, there is uh, declining public sector employment and limited uh, private sector job creation. Uh, another key factor is, is the fact that there's a stagnant, stagnant economy. 
um, declining hydro hydrocarbon reserves, oil production is declining. LNG production is now coming online, um, but the amount of, of LNG that the country will produce is not going to be sufficient to change uh, the development curve um, uh, significantly. Uh, there is significant currency weaknesses. Last year, uh, the Yemeni government had to spend uh, $800 million shoring up the currency. Um, Yemen faces significant neg negative images abroad, uh, thanks to negative media, um, and has weak infrastructure in terms of power, roads, um, water, and poor human resource capacity, all which is scaring foreign direct investment away. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, development assistance remains um, far lower than averages for similar, similar uh, least development countries in the region. Uh, it's not a question of resources being available. Significant resources have been mobilized. It's a question of a bottleneck in terms of the country's capacity to, to uh, deliver um, uh, mechanisms to spend those resources. And then in terms of education, um, there's a focus at the moment on quality, uh, on quantity, not quality, um, given the uh, huge numbers of young people uh, in the, in, uh, of, 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 of an educational age. Um, vast uh, effort is being spent on building infrastructure without a significant uh, parallel effort being spent on, on the software um, in terms of capacity building uh, institutions to manage an educational system and training of teachers and trainers to, to deliver effective training. And then uh, on education, uh, the output of the education remains largely dealing from the economy. Um, efforts are, are being made, changes are taking place in terms of private sector engagement in the curricula um, and, uh, and, and linking uh, the needs of the economy more closely to, to the, to the uh, education system, but it's not enough. Um, what are the risks of unemployment amongst young people? Well, obviously there's, there's personal aspects uh, in terms of, of uh, crushing of aspirations of young people. Um, in terms of young families, um, continued unemployment is pushing young families further into poverty um, with, with the high uh, population, the high birth rates and decline in real-term real wages um, over the last two decades. Uh, unemployment is only serving to push families uh, below the poverty line. Um, we have this concept of weighthood uh, as defined by the Middle East Youth Initiative. Um, where young people are basically trapped uh, in stasis and are unable to, to pass through the critical transitions that they, they have in life, uh, that without a job they're unable to uh, get married, without a job they're unable to find housing. So, so young people are basically in this period of, of, of weighthood. Um, and then uh, an underpinning to this uh, lack of employment, lack of income, is increasing frustration and disillusion. And that's a potential source of conflict. And it makes young people in Yemen uh, with few opportunities and, and little education susceptible to recruitment by um, anti-state forces. Um, in terms of the regime itself, um, Tunisia gives a stark warning. Uh, that social grievances can quickly escalate into broader demands. Um, and that's where we are in Yemen right now. Um, and then unemployment is also being used as um, uh, a political tool uh, by anti-state actors um, who are basically accusing the government of, of um, unequal allocation of state resources. For example, the Southern Movement is using the lack of employment as, as, a, as a political tool. The reality is that's rather a, a red herring uh, because the government does not have the capacity to create jobs regardless of whether it wanted to allocate them to one group or another. Um, policy responses. Um, we, see, we see some macroeconomic responses, as, as Nada mentioned and, and, and linked to the other presentations. We've had a flurry of high-profile, short-term emergency response measures, including public sector wage increases, tax cuts, subsidies, and social security expansion. Um, the government rationale is that this is a, an immediate measure to placate uh, protesters. But the reality is, uh, and the big question is, how can the state afford this? Um, the, the national deficit was $2 billion, uh, almost $3 billion last year. Um, it's estimated that these uh, short-term measures will cost at least $100 million. Um, and commentators suggest that the, the ability of the government to uh, carry out these uh, short-term measures may only uh, be for a period of around six months. So we're just, just putting off frustration to the summer, basically. 
Um, then there's a number of labor market responses, um, those that have existed for a while and those that are now um, being introduced. One that's just been introduced in the last couple of weeks is the idea of a graduate unemployment fund. Um, there are 180,000 unemployed students registered with the Ministry of Civil Service who have not been employed for between two and eight years. Uh, the idea of the fund is to create 50,000 jobs a year um, using uh, a combination of resources from sales tax and a 1% payroll tax on public sector employers. Um, the idea is that it's, it's designed again to target some of the most potential vocal protesters, but the challenge is where are these jobs going to come from? And as we know with these types of, types of programs, we're targeting the unemployed that have been out of the labor market for all, a huge amount of time, are the least motivated, and are expecting jobs on a plate. So to, to, to really turn them around is going to be a huge challenge. A um, couple of other responses that are now increasingly in, in the spotlight uh, is, is uh, a strategy for GCC labor migration. This was a policy initiative launched in 2009. Um, for the Yemeni government, this has, has a key, it's become a key priority. It's now one of their top 10 priorities for economic reform. It's clearly a, a pressure release valve um, in terms of identifying opportunities for Yemenis to work abroad. And the, the recognition is that remittances and skills repatriation over time will fuel domestic growth. For the GCC, there is an alignment of interest um, in terms of they have a vested interest in, in preventing instability in Yemen. And uh, domestically, there is a strong incentive now to, to substitute um, uh, the current large uh, South Asian uh, worker populations with, with Arab labor. Uh, the challenge is, however, is, is there is resistance in Yemen uh, to what is perceived as a brain drain. Uh, there are security concerns um, amongst GCC countries, and the most fundamental barrier is one of, of perception of Yemeni skills and the fact that Yemenis uh, are perceived as, as, as uncompetitive compared to South Asian labor in the GCC. Um, the other major labor market policy, which is now uh, increasingly uh, prioritized, is one of, of microenterprise, adopted in 2008 as a key mechanism to address poverty, poverty and unemployment. The government of Yemen is now backing the capacity building of the sector. There's a new microfinance law from 2009, which allows the creation of microfinance banks. And the rationale is that microfinance, even in a stagnant economy, if uh, pursued um, proactively, targeting uh, underpenetrated um, high growth areas or targeting sectors that offer uh, export potentials, can uh, drive local economic development. Um, the challenges are there's a weak lending culture, there's limited uh, outreach beyond uh, uh, rural uh, urban areas, and the overall wider macroeconomic uh, situation impacts on the growth of the sector given the purchasing power of, 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 of uh, the population. Um, from our work in Yemen, but this really applies to, to a broader set of countries, we, we, we've come across, uh, uh, these are our, our kind of key policy recommendations. Firstly, you can't rob Peter to pay Paul. What we mean by this is um, basically what's happening in Yemen and other countries in terms of these short-term measures is a recycling of money. Subsidies are being lifted in some places. Subsidies are being uh, uh, introduced in other places. Uh, public sector employment is being increased in others uh, whilst being uh, decreased in others. So basically the same money is just being recirculated in the system and it's not uh, anything innovative. Um, in terms of short-term solutions, um, as I just mentioned with, with the subsidies and other activities, if not structured properly um, and if they're unsustainable in the way they're delivered, they just build long-term resentment. Um, emergency employment packages rarely work unless they're structured effectively. Um, resources need to be deployed in a way that are sustainable and uh, create sustainable employment opportunities. Um, don't ignore small businesses. This goes back to the, the micro-enterprise approach, that even in, an, in a stagnant economy, uh, employment creation can occur if targeted to the right sectors. For example, if you look at uh, honey, coffee, coffee, and fisheries, they all offer significant opportunities for enterprise growth and employment generation in Yemen. Um, GCC or bust. Basically, this, this is the fact that um, any considerations about the, the merits of, of training Yemenis to work in, in GCC now need to be put to bed because without 
this strategy as being part of an overall employment mix for the country, uh, job creation at the levels needed um, is not going to happen. Um, so it needs to be considered seriously and proactively. Uh, it's not a question of, of how much, but how. Uh, Yemen has plenty of resources, both nationally and internationally. 2006 saw a donor conference that pledged $5 billion in aid to Yemen. Um, only about 20 to 30% of that aid has actually been spent because there are bottlenecks and governance challenges about spending that money. So the question is, what models and what mechanisms can be put in place to give confidence to uh, uh, donors that that money can be used wisely? Um, Plugging cables uh, creates immediate impacts. What we mean by this is too many initiatives in Yemen are being operated in a, with a silo mentality. Let's take uh, microenterprise, for example. There is a whole range of programs on increasing uh, access to finance. There is a whole strategy around entrepreneurship, education, and incubation. And then there's a whole um, range of activities around business development services. Currently uh, and historically, they've operated in isolation. But by linking them strategically together, uh, you create a value chain that can create large-scale sustainable employment and enterprise development opportunities. And then uh, finally, public-private partnerships offer recipes for success. What we mean by this is structuring partnerships in a way that bring the best uh, of the government, recognizing limi limited capabilities and institutional capacity challenges with civil society and government to deliver solutions where incentives are aligned for success and are sustainable uh, in, in their delivery. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to end on a couple of programmatic examples where Silatex involved that maybe give a hint at, at potential solutions going forward and that could be relevant for the region. One is a construction skills training initiative, um, which is a public-private partnership between the government, Silatex, and the private sector. It focuses on training, qualifications, and placement services for Yemenis in the GCC as a priority of the, the government's uh, second priority. Um, it, it involves government budgetary support and infrastructure provision uh, using government training facilities. It has private sector endorsement in the qualifications framework and investment into an ethical manpower solution, which is the interface with GCC employers. Um, we've just completed a pilot that's trained 1,000 uh, young Yemenis in construction skills, and now we're moving into the post-pilot phase uh, with uh, budget support from the government of Yemen to train and place up to 20,000 Yemeni labor in the GCC. Um, there's significant interest from GCC employers, including in Qatar, linked to major infrastructure investments like the 2020 uh, World Cup. Um, and then on the micro-enterprise side, um, we, we have an approach which is around an integrated solution for youth-run enterprises, uh, integrating partnerships between microfinance institutions, enterprise education providers, and business uh, support service providers. Uh, this, in, this initiative's supported over 8,500 businesses uh, uh, start or grow in just over a year, including 800 startups with, with, who are straight out of, of, of the education system. Uh, with 15,000 employment uh, uh, impacts, and that is set to scale to, to 50,000 businesses supported by 2013. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, and sticking to time, we'll move right along to Jordan. Thank you, uh, Anada. Thanks for uh, uh, Carney and Lassen for inviting me. I um, want to start my uh, presentation on Jordan by uh, a rather uh, general uh, uh, note uh, in the sense of somehow responding to uh, uh, an important question that uh, was posed this morning about the relation between education and economic growth. Um, I feel that we're really undermining also the importance of demography uh, in the sense uh, at least in the case of Jordan, uh, as you can see, and I started my presentation with this, because I think uh, the question is not only how to uh, f uh, uh, revisit the education uh, uh, policy or the economic policies, but what you can do abo about also the demographic structure, with 30% uh, of the population are aged between 15 and 29, 
If we add the uh, youngest group, uh, what well, that is 0 to 14, it's 65 percent of the population. Immediately, we should expect a very low participation rate in the labor market given this structure and given the level of unemployment among the group of 15 to 29. So this is to say that uh, uh, it's triangular actually, uh, education, demography and the economic growth that leads to uh, the difficulties in the uh, labor market. Uh, I will also, uh, um, I think also numbers are important and speak some sign for themselves. And this is uh, basically, uh, this is how I can move the... Uh, uh, unemployment in, in Jordan, uh, again, I think sort of we are repeating the story that we've been hearing this morning between male, female and the level of unemployment. Level of unemployment amongst female in Jordan, it's even more than doubled that uh, for male. This is true uh, since 2006 and uh, until 2009. Uh, while it's 10% amongst uh, male, it's about 24 uh, amongst female. However, given uh, if we look at the number of unemployed among male and female actually, though the percentage for female is much higher than for the male, uh, it's actually in terms of number, it's 65% of the unemployed are male and not female. And the reason for this is not because actually given the demographic structure it's the discouraged labor and it's a matter of actually technical definition uh, about the uh, level of uh, or the participation rate amongst female in the labor market where we have this low uh, 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 in terms of the number of uh, unemployed among female uh, in Jordan. Uh, it's the discouraged labor basically, educated discouraged labor as we will uh, see as we uh, go along or uh, how it, it is uh, uh, distributed. Um, also, uh, urban rural divide in, in, in the case of Jordan when it comes to uh, unemployment is, is quite uh, showing itself that there is uh, uh, the unemployment uh, in the uh, rural area is much higher than in the urban and this if we talk about the implications of the uh, unemployment in general, uh, we should expect the uh, uh, internal migration and uh, that people are migrating internally from rural periphery areas to the centers where jobs uh, has been created. This will uh, actually is quite linked to the development model and the kind of growth that is uh, uh, registered in, in, in Jordan over the last uh, uh, couple of uh, years. Uh, here uh, we have the um, uh, number of unemployed Jordanians 15 years and uh, the age group uh, between 15 and 19, 20 uh, to 29, or let's take 15 to 29, it represents uh, the most, the, the highest percentage of unemployed. So uh, when uh, Dr. Awad was saying that indeed it only exists among the youth, the unemployment uh, uh, in Jordan, this is actually, I, I simply uh, substantiate what you have said for the two years, 2008, 2009, there is no reason to expect that these figures would change uh, either before or after knowing the rigidity in the labor market uh, in, in, in general and in Jordan in particular, this has been uh, the case. So it is actually, unemployment is a youth phenomena uh, in Jordan. Here we're looking at the uh, education level amongst the uh, uh, unemployed. You would see, and I just want to take you to some of these uh, figures, that uh, uh, unemployment for female, for illiterate female, it's the lowest, uh, as you can see. Again, uh, if we to read between numbers, this is not because the in employment is high for this group, it's just because actually this group is not actively seeking jobs. As such, they are not uh, 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 counted for as unemployed. And here we, uh, I, I might also draw the attention that we are talking about narrow employment, which is actively seeking jobs, and the broad unemployment, which is actually covers all uh, those who are unemployed within any society. Broad unemployment, actually, if we to about uh, if we to measure it for all the countries, I think it could be double than the official announced figures. And at least in the case of Jordan, I know it's evolved around 20 percent, while the official rate is 12.9 percent. And this is not something that even the official would deny when they are talking about unemployment rates. But we're talking, and someone asked about the returns to education this morning. Look at the unemployment rates among female those possess 
intermediate diploma or bachelor degree or higher. It's the highest rate of unemployment in Jordan actually. It's about 25% of those who are uh, of female possessing a university degree are actually 26%. It's actually unemployed. unemployed. Also, the similar uh, for intermediate diploma, it's in an extremely high percentage, it's about 22%. For society that actually allocate resources to education, this is a disincentive to educate. Now, the debate on education, whether it's a value in itself, which we will agree on, or this is something that for families with limited resources, that this would discourage families to spend any more, any more money on educating females. Though it is a success story on one hand, it's a failure story on the other, on, 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 on the demand side. And this actually, I uh, would come to this uh, in, in my conclusion, whether we should continue this policy or what could be done about this, uh, uh, if, if this is the, the, the product of the education system and the outcome of the uh, development process or the economic uh, process. While the problem for, for uh, male in Jordan, it's actually on those less educated. It's for those who possess less uh, than secondary school, the highest rate of unemployment uh, in Jordan. So this is where those people are left behind with, with limited uh, job opportunities. If we to actually add the issue of underemployment here, uh, I think this even would further complicate the story of unemployment uh, but as Lahsan said this morning, reading even the figures about unemployment and how it's distributed is, is, is in itself a self-telling story about the failure of both the economic and the labor market institutions in, in, in these countries. Here I added another dimension to the unemployment story, which is related, related to the poverty rate. Indeed, here the figures I highlighted a uh, few governorates. Here I look at the figures at governance level in Jordan with the highest rate of unemployment uh, uh, and I try to correlate this and relate it to the poverty rate. The story here is that there is no correlation between unemployment and poverty. And the reason for this is that being employed given the wage structure in Jordan doesn't mean that you were living above the poverty line. This is simply the story of reading this line. You can uh, be working within, uh, at any sector in Jordan, but not necessarily if you take the dependency, ratio, the, dependency, uh, the dependency rate in Jordan and how many people you are supporting. And real wage development over the last couple of years is telling us that that's not even statistically uh, uh, valid case. So you could be working, and actually it, the, the story uh, here, uh, government with highest level of, of, of unemployment, are, uh, sometimes it correlates with poverty, sometimes it, it does not correlate with the with, uh, poverty rate. I, I, I try to look at some of, uh, because of, of the questions uh, 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 sent to us, to look at some other socio-indicators related to the uh, unemployed. Most of them, they are actually single. As you can see, uh, in, in, in total, it's about 70% of them are single and uh, I think this is uh, quite uh, expected given the age group but also given that there is no resources for them and we're coming from societies that you know unless you are really working you cannot be qualified even to uh, get married and uh, about the status of whether they have been worked before or not uh, seven, uh, about 57 percent of them never worked before so they never joined the labor market. This is quite, they never made it to the labor market, even if they are uh, educated. And that applies for both male and female uh, in, in, uh, in the case of Jordan. Here is uh, something that I would like to spend just uh, sometimes. It's uh, the number and percentage of unemployed uh, by marital status and six. And actually, uh, it's... Uh, okay, I will run uh, very quickly. Here again, uh, it's 47% uh, are uh, uh, single uh, or unmarried. It's, um, oh, I want to move, uh, uh, I, I think I presented that, but uh, actually uh, there is a mistake in, in this table. It's mostly household that are, uh, it's, sorry, it's, no, I don't, uh, I want to focus on this. Uh, this is the story I, uh, I am quite interested in telling here, is that sons and daughters represent 73% of the totally unemployed in Jordan, which means that it's actually unemployment 
for uh, head of households is represent 24% of the unemployed. The rest are sons or daughters living with their parents. This is uh, something that is, uh, you can imagine now the, uh, the, 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 the socio-economic, the, the, the social implications of somebody who has been educated and unable to access the labor market and living with his family, with his, with his father or with his mother. So this is uh, something that uh, I thought is quite interesting to show uh, in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the social status of, of, of the unemployed. And if somebody is telling you that poor cannot afford to stay out of the labor market, it's because of the, the family structure and the informal structure of subsidies in, within the, uh, 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 within, at least this is in Jordan, but I guess this is the case in other uh, uh, countries. Um, I want to, uh, since uh, only now three minutes left, I want to move to uh, uh, focus on uh, not only creating jobs, but uh, also uh, the quality of jobs that the Jordanian economy has been creating. And this takes us back to the same story. Where is the economy is heading? What kind of jobs the economy is creating? And what kind of uh, 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 job uh, has been created and what kind uh, of uh, development model that uh, our countries are adopting or, or, or country uh, is adopting. It's actually, again, creating jobs doesn't solve the issue of uh, 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 poverty, doesn't actually, and again, I think it, it was said this morning, education is no more uh, 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 a tool for social mobility uh, in, in, in our economy. The rhetoric in Jordan is that we are heading towards knowledge economy. At least this is the official uh, statement. While looking at the uh, dynamics of the economy over the last 10 years, actually it's creating jobs at, a low end, at, at the low end of the market. It's uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, low paid services, uh, uh, informal economy or other stories. So, so where we're heading uh, and t talking about knowledge economy, but the dynamics of the economy is exactly going uh, in, uh, in the wrong direction. Actually, I want to challenge some of uh, the, uh, whether to f re reform education or to reform the economy and what is, I look at the figure, at the number of students who are accessing the finishing schools and going into universities in Jordan and compare this number to the number of students that finishing schools in Europe and going to vocational training and other schools. Actually, the pyramid is upside down. These economies are industrialized economy, it is knowledge economy, but they are absorbing less number of students going into schools and uh, uh, attending uh, universities less than Jordan. Jordan sending a huge number of students to the universities and we are actually quite sure about they are going to, and I have some figures about them, they are, we are sure that they are heading to be unemployed or underemployed in the public sector or in any other sector. So here is policy intervention is actually extremely important. So in, is to make the transition from school to uh, proper vocational uh, uh, training. Working conditions is another thing because if you are working and you're still living under uh, or you're still poor, it's this also uh, an incentive to live on the social safety net social safety net or the uh, informal family support subsidies instead of making it to uh, the labor market. And here I talk about issues that is probably common to other countries about family structure, uh, culture of shame again, uh, why, why more people going into universities are not uh, going into uh, vocational training and probably uh, some uh, something challenging is about lack of uh, seriousness. I just want to say one thing, another is looking at me, is, is about labor market institutions. Yes, it is very weak. I think also this is relati related to the political structure of our economy, that we have a structure of labor market institutions. You have unions, you have, but actually it's not an active institution. You really don't have serious uh, trade unions or labor unions that defends and that at least reach a balance uh, between various stakeholders within the society. There is no serious social dialogue, even about issues related to the minimum wage. And um, again, I am saying no quick fixing. I think it has been presented already that uh, countries, governments, looking at short-term solutions and response to long-term challenges that, doesn't, uh, that really uh, do not work. And finally, I think we can, uh, I, here, uh, just uh, to finish on this note, we cannot really 
blame the private sector for what's happening because if I am a private sector entrepreneur, I really don't know where to go with my government's policy. They're talking about something, they are doing something else. And I am expected as a private sector to respond to a kind of social challenges that are emerging as a result of the labor market or demographic structure. So let's also be reasonable here when we address the role of the private sector since they, we lack strategy, we lack clear development model, we lack consistency in the policy making, I, don't, I think they would be going after uh, like quick wins, short wins here and there in response to the overall uh, uh, policies that uh, we are adopting. Thank you, and I hope that I stick to my time. Thanks. Thank you, Brahim. That's a very welcome bias uh, <laughs> towards the direction of social dialogue at the end. So thanks for those insights. Um, we move now to Nader and the case of Syria. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, really thank you to the uh, Carnegie Middle East Center uh, for in, uh, inviting me to present on the case of Syria. Um, really, the, the key issue was, try to ha was trying to decide what to talk about. There's so, much, so many issues to discuss in terms of youth. I'm going to focus on a few of them, uh, realizing, of course, that there are some key issues like more in-depth analysis of gender dimensions and such that we can take up in the, in the discussion afterwards. Um, so just to give you a brief overview of the situation of Syria, uh, Syria is r currently in the middle of a transition from a state control to a social market economy. Um, there's been a lot of progress made um, in terms of improving the business environment, but um, time is, is of an essence. Um, Syria is becoming, uh, d d both trade and fiscal deficits are potentially increasing, and there's, there's a need for reform now. Um, there's also indications that the education system is not uh, producing um, students or, p or people, young people with the necessary um, skills demanded by the labor market. Um, and the government has, is aware of this and is undergoing major educational reforms, um, both in terms of improving access and the quality of public schools and allowing private schools to operate. Um, other challenges include the global financial crisis, mainly in Syria it's second round effects, and then there's a severe drought uh, whereby about 300,000 people have migrated from um, the northeast region of the country to other parts of the country. Um, but there's also new opportunities for young people with the right knowledge, skills, and motivation. Um, but we really need to think about changing institutions because institutional changes is what's lagging behind uh, rather than the changes in the, in the economic structure. Um, briefly, um, I did a quick review of where we are in terms of youth trends and unemployment. And uh, for the Middle East, um, it was interesting to note, uh, this is according to the most recent uh, global employment trends uh, that was released last month, um, that uh, youth unemployment is actually, it's the highest in the world, we know this, uh, but it's actually still trending downward, even with the fiscal crisis. Now, the fiscal, the, the economic crisis probably um, reduced the speed of, by which uh, youth unemployment rates are going down, uh, but still it's, it's good to know. For, for Syria, um, uh, essentially the trend is still downward. Again, uh, it went from fairly high, from close to the Middle Eastern average uh, to about 17% in 2009. Um, but there is still a problem in terms of transitions. There's uh, young people spend several, uh, you know, take long months and sometimes years to find work. Um, and there is an, an indication that a lot of this is taking place at for secondary school and intermediate institute um, p graduates. Uh, universities, at least in terms of older data, suggest that university graduates have an easier time to transition. However, more recent data, which we're still working on, suggests that actually uh, unemployment rates among university graduates uh, compared to other groups has actually been going up. And we'll talk about why that is. Um, just to get a sense of the transition, um, you, get a sen you, get, you get to see this is looking at age groups for men and women, and then if you look at the blue line, there are students. Uh, if you add the students to the people looking for work, the unemployed, it's the red, and if you add the students unemployed and working, basically active in some way, either in education or labor force, it's the green line. The key thing here is to note is that for young men, uh, really it's a transition from school to looking to work to work. And it's a fairly smooth transition, even though it takes time in terms of moving from unemployed to work. For young women, it's very much a trend from school to out of the labor force, a little bit, long time to look for jobs, um, and then some employment. Um, 
looking at unemployment, uh, they both peak for both age groups around the age 21, with unemployment rates for men about 10% at that age and unemployment rates for women about 38%. So a major gender difference in unemployment. Uh, this is using the 2007 survey data. So if you look at different years, you might get for different rates, but consistently Syria has had a major gender um, in, uh, difference in terms of uh, unemployment rates. Um, looking at employment trends, because we really mi min mentioned that uh, there's unemployment and there's employment, and they're two, two they're very different issues. And indeed, even though unemployment has been going down, there's no evidence that employment has been really increasing. That blue line on the bottom is essentially employment over the years. Um, that's been growing at about, what, 1% or less? Uh, whereas the, the increase in the working age population is probably around 3-4%, three, uh, three, especially if you include uh, what you're expecting to be is more uh, female involvement in the labor market, not less. What's happening? Um, first of all, there is a big drop in agricultural employment, um, especially among women. So one of the things is there's, there's, diff there's changes within the sectors that we need to take into consideration. A second one is that there's been increase in retirement, including early retirement. And part of this is to do with public policies, which have basically encouraged public sector employees to retire. Um, possibly also as a mix of, um, uh, in terms of a mix of what's required in the labor market and, and encouraging some of the people with, with different skills that's required to retire early. Um, also, there's been a doubling of secondary and tertiary enrollment rates. So people are staying longer in school at, at large numbers, and so this is delaying entry into labor force. Uh, but there's a, there's a time of reckoning where you basically have to find jobs for people who are finishing universities now and, and to make sure that that's the case. And, and this increased pressure for university graduates may be leading to this, what we see as evidence of rising pressure for, um, uh, in terms of unemployment rates among, among uh, university graduates. Um, this is just one part of an analysis that we're doing um, with the World Bank on labor markets in Syria, part of a Miles uh, analysis that's feeding into the government's strategic planning. I won't go into much detail and in additional analyses, but there's a report hopefully that's coming out um, in June or July that goes into more detail. Um, okay, root causes. Uh, we've dis discussed demographic trends. There has been a youth bulge. The youth bulge um, basically has been going through the population, peaked at around 2005, and now has gone through the population. Uh, but it's still centered around the time young people graduate from universities. So again, there's this labor supply pressure in terms of people currently now graduating from universities and looking for work, which we have to worry about. Um, something to also keep in mind is that these young people are getting married and having kids. And so there's a second youth bulge that's along the way. Fertility rates are actually going up because of, or not fertility rates, at least population growth. Uh, because you have large numbers of, fertility is actually going down, but population is growing because you have a large number of young people having kids. And so a second youth bulge, probably a little bit smaller, is expected in about 15 years' time. Essentially, policies should be put in place and kept in place, anticipating these kinds of changes. Um, another root uh, cause is education, and um, we know that we've already discussed the issue of education several times, um, some stylized uh, facts. If you think of a productive worker needing knowledge, skills, and abilities or experience, um, much of the education in Syria and the Middle East is very much focusing on knowledge transfer. Um, rote memorization of texts, very little in terms of skill development, very little in terms of experience. Um, in terms of knowledge transfer, Access has been increasing, but it's still uneven if you look at different areas of the country, like rural areas. Um, quality has been a concern. Uh, there's key gaps, foreign language, technical skills. Um, and there's still an issue of focusing on passing, passing exams rather than actually developing skills and gaining experience. To give you some idea of this, uh, this is now looking at net school enrollment rates for primary and secondary. You see there's a, a large increase in secondary school enrollment rates. I didn't include uh, university and tertiary education, but you'll also see basically a doubling um, of uh, tertiary education during uh, the past 10 years only. So again, a delay in entry, but there's a time of reckoning where you need to make sure you have jobs for these people. Um, Okay, how much do people uh, earn when they, uh, when they get to the labor market? Um, these are age earnings profiles. At every age, for every different level of schooling, how much people are earning in terms of mo monthly wages. Um, in Syria, it's fairly, fairly flat um, uh, and fairly compressed, which means additional years of schooling aren't necessarily leading to uh, additional wages. 
Part of this could be due to um, essentially what's being taught and relevance for the labor market. Um, part of it could be due to um, the structure of, um, of the private sector and, and how it's operating and the, the fact that the, the public sector is still a leader in terms of wage setting and its wage, uh, wage scales have been compressed for some time. So um, average returns to education maybe uh, at this rate is about 3%. In the Middle East, it's about 6%. Worldwide, it's about 10 to 15%. Um, again, some of the work from, with the World Bank suggests that rates of returns to education have been increasing over time. So the situation in Syria is actually approaching now the Middle East average slowly. Part of this is due to the changing economic structure and, and giving more, uh, basically putting a larger value on, on higher education. In terms of looking, f if you ask young people what it is that is, is having them uh, who are looking for work, what's the main difficulty? Most of them will say it's about weak credentials. Uh, we do not have ne the necessarily educational or credential background to find the jobs that are there, uh, for the jobs that are there. And so it's, it's a mismatch, according to young people themselves. Um, work requirements and environment is the second most uh, reason. This is mostly among women who, say, who basically say we don't like necessarily the environment of the work that we're finding, and so we're taking longer to find the right place for us. Um, job availability is a third level. So again, it's part of it is about jobs being available, but mostly I think, it, according to young people, it's about a mismatch. Um, labor demand issues. Uh, macroeconomic conditions are stable, but there's room for improvement. There's been health, health uh, growth, but uh, not so much increase in employment. The key thing I want to uh, focus in, uh, on is investment climate. Um, there has been progress in reforming the business environment, but there's a lot more to be done. In terms of ranking, Syria is ranked 144 out of 183 countries in terms of ease of doing business. Um, to give you a sense, Middle Eastern countries, only Iraq, Djibouti, and Sudan, I believe, are lower. So there's a lot of work to be done here. Uh, to give you an example, if you think of difficulties in starting a business and access to credit, two of the main issues for Syria, Young people tend to be more innovative in terms of the kinds of business they develop. They tend to be, you know, use more maybe uh, in technology in the kinds of businesses they develop. They're the, kinds of, they're the kinds of businesses that would draw more on young people and young people with higher skills. So if you don't reduce those barriers to starting a business, I'm not talking about labor market regulations or anything else, then you're, you're, you're foregoing a really great potential for job increase or job creation for, uh, for young people. And so this is how this feeds in. Um, it's not an issue of deregulation, it's basically smarter regulation, making sure that you regulate businesses, but making sure that there's an incentive to start these kinds of businesses. There's also low levels of market competition. Um, and within Syria, there's really barriers to entry, there's barriers to competition, some of these are informal. There's really in, informal organizational structures, um, family, even the largest businesses are run by families and individuals who, you know, don't necessarily employ the best person for the job. Um, so this kind of mismatch is contributing to low levels of productivity, which we see in Syria. Uh, not, just, not just education, but the way the game is played. So I think setting the rules of the game and, or rethinking the rules of the game is a key element of this. Um, institutional uh, factors are very important. Um, this is a large, I'm going to just summarize what this basically says. This is looking at wage rate, hourly wage rates by public and private sector. Basically, for men, they're about the same. For women, wage rates are much higher, are higher in the public sector, hourly wage rates. And the increase has been more on the public side over the past 10 years than the private side. So if you add to the wage rates, the fact that you have benefits, leave policies, job security, young people prefer public sector jobs, and they still do. And, and as long as there's this distinction between public sector and private sector work, they're going to queue up for these public sector jobs and they're willing to forego opportunities in the private sector to gain experience or, or do, uh, take other decisions in terms of the education in order to pursue these public sector jobs. There's evidence that the, the preference rate is decreasing over time, but it's still there. If you look at share of public sector employment by level of education, you see essentially that um, when you have an, a degree like an immediate institute or university degrees, you're 60, 70, 80 percent more likely to work for public sector. So educational attainment is one of the entry points. It's a way, your ticket to getting a public sector job. And people t use that ticket. Okay, um, two minutes. Looking at some of the risks and responses. 
Um, we we know the situation is improving in terms of educational access and options, um, but concern regarding quality and efficiency. So we have to make these uh, systems, education systems more flexible, move beyond knowledge transfer to skill development. Um, the government is introducing reforms, but there's been a mis mismatch in terms of not just uh, skills necessary for labor market, but mismatch in, ed in expectations. So if you, have, if you have young people not really knowing what to expect and how to plan for their future, they may make poor choices in terms of selecting their educational attainment, uh, the career, um, jobs that they take. Um, so really, young people need to be more involved in terms of getting work experience and discussing policy issues. Um, so they become more aware of these issues. And we need to also understand what's really happening. Uh, so we're, we're looking at doing more in-depth analysis of really what these expectations are and how they match up. Uh, one of the studies is with, uh, funded by, by UNICEF and UNFPA to look a little more closely at this. Um, the situation is improving in terms of unemployment and income, but there are concerns regarding distributions and equity of opportunity. I think e equity of opportunity is key. If you ask young people, are you better off, or people in general, are you better off today than you were five, ten years ago, they'll say yes. What are your expectations for the future? They're very optimistic. Are you currently satisfied? They'll say no. Why not? Well, because I get a sense that other people are, are really being able to take advantage of these reforms much more than I am. So I've gotten an apple, but somebody else has gotten two. And, and these issues of equity and concerns of equity, um, I think, are key here. Um, you have uh, wages increase, but not as increase um, in terms of uh, costs are increased faster. Housing costs are increasing. There's a delay of marriage to set up. That leads to frustrations, uh, frustrations among young people. And so um, these need to be taken into consideration in terms of uh, these things. So. Quickly, uh, two more points. Many, uh, many routes are, are basically transitionary. They're going to change, but, but they have associated risks. Demographic trends you need to deal with, they're going to come again. Uh, school enrollment is temporary, you need to create jobs. Um, you have to think about job creation at different skill levels. You need to create jobs for the higher educated because they're increasing. You need to create low skill jobs because of the people who are moving from agriculture to other sectors. So it's not simply looking at one element or one, uh, one issue. You have to really think of the broad spectrum here. Um, and finally, the main issue I want to leave you with is the weak competitiveness and business climate. Um, really, we need to think about more about reducing barriers to entry to create opportunities for young people especially and, um, and think about public sector employment policy reform. Thank you. Sorry for additional time. Thank you, Nader. In order to stay to time and allow, I think, enough for discussion, which is going to be interesting, uh, Hannah and Lebanon next. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here today, and I would really like to thank the Carnegie Middle East Center for inviting me to take part in this very interesting discussion that we're having today. And um, despite the very heartbreaking you know, realities that we've seen and talked about today, it is, I think, promising to see that people are working hard and, and organizations are um, trying slower. Okay, is that better? Okay. I was just saying that it is still promising to see that there are individuals and organizations that are trying to address issues that pertain to youth, among which is unemployment. Um, I would have, um, before I begin my presentation, can I have it? Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. I would like to. Um, I would. I would have liked to have more statistical analysis in my presentation, but given the weak data set, I think that we have across the region, despite the numbers that we're seeing, I think um, has pushed me to take an alternative perspective on the issue, which is an institutional perspective. And I'll talk to you more about this in our, um, the research that we have been doing in terms of addressing youth unemployment in Lebanon. But let me first begin with sharing with you, I think we've seen this many times today, but um, I cannot pass but say, talk about the unemployment rate in Lebanon as it compares with the other uh, countries across the region. And, uh, um, and as you see, Lebanon is at almost uh, uh, the same as the average of the MENA region unemployment rate. When we take a closer look at Lebanon's uh, labor market context, we see that the youth unemployment is particularly this this point. Oh, good. So we see that the youth unemployment is um, almost 50% higher than the total uh, unemployment population in the country. And when we look at females, this, uh, this becomes more of an acute problem. 
Um, next, I would also like to point out the demographic context because when I strongly believe that when we talk about unemployment, we cannot um, overlook the demographic context of the country. And back in the 1970s, we had just a perfect population pyramid. However, uh, this population shifted and um, today we, we are um, experiencing this youth bulge. I think that is going across um, all nations in the Middle East and North African region. However, what is really um, really interesting is not just today, but it is what is projected for the future. And this is what is concerned to me because this, uh, this youth bulge that we see today is going to shift into an aging population. And taking the situation of Lebanon uh, in particular, where we lack a social security network for the future, you know, th this aging population will come to a time that they need health insurance, they need um, other, other social security um, networks that we, we lack in this country. And so if this population, if this bulge that we have here today doesn't really be, you, you know, produced for itself today, then it's going to cause a different kind of problem in the future. So this is, I think, is a very important issue to raise and I would like to highlight. Next, I would like to move on to the institutional perspective. And, um, you know, indeed, there are higher rates of youth unemployment in, the, in, in, the, in Lebanon and across the MENA region. And education, um, I come from an educational background, so I see that education is really central to this issue and we cannot just pass across it. And higher education institutions are very complex. And in a country like Lebanon, we have a lot of private investments, not just investments, but Lebanon's higher education system is mainly composed of private institutions. We have only one public in university in the country. And we have a lot of private investments that go into higher education in Lebanon, just like the other MENA region countries. However, we're having minimal payoff on these investments. And this is really sad to see that we have this large educated population youth that are not really uh, able to find any jobs because first we are lacking the job creation and next we have a very low labor absorption um, rate in the country. So it, sometimes some people may argue that this um, unemployment is mitigated by the emigration and the remittance economy that Lebanon highly depends on. But in times of turbulence and economic turbulence and other and outside, like we saw a couple years ago in Dubai, this is directly reflected on the remittance economy that we depend on in our country here. Um, governments can set all the policies they want, but in a, again, with a private um, private higher education sector like in Lebanon, the institutions may not always follow these policies that are set forth by the government. What are they doing to mitigate this problem? And what are they doing to address the rising rates of unemployment across among their graduates? So this is what I will share with you. Um, but before I do that, I would like to point out the Lebanon's institutional context in terms of universities. And you know, like many countries, we have seen or witnessed the massification of higher education in the country. However, what is interesting about Lebanon is that this has been um, particularly limited or it was concentrated more uh, during a certain period of time as we see here, and this is right after the end of the Civil War. We saw a sharp increase in the number of universities in the country. Um, and I will address that later on, how it relates to unemployment. So in terms of my findings today, um, I will ta I'll, I'll take you through very briefly the findings and um, just to give you a brief idea of the participants, we had uh, looked at the university presidents, we interviewed university presidents as senior leaders of their institutions. We also uh, didn't take a sample, we interviewed all university presidents in the country and um, we also met with a few uh, representatives or a sample of the government agencies and the labor market representatives and we looked at their perspective of what universities can do to mitigate this unemployment, youth unemployment uh, crisis in the country. So to start with what they believe there are the roots of the unemployment crisis in Lebanon. And I would like to point out that um, the, both the university rectors and the private sector uh, pointed out that the roots in their opinion or their, from their perspective was mainly institutional. That the universities were mainly responsible for this youth unemployment crisis. And some of the things that were cited were issues of orientation and uh, like, for example the transition from school to university. The students come in lacking this orientation and they blame this on the university itself. Um, interestingly the government sector uh, 
felt that strongly that the uh, roots for this unemployment crisis in Lebanon is mainly political, citing issues as uh, political instability that we have been witnessing for quite some time in the country and other issues such as the lack of a strategic plan for the country itself, which will directly impact the, um, the youth in the country as well as other populations, but particularly issues of, of employment. Um, I will move along to the risks, from, again, from the perspectives of the uh, senior policymakers. Um, we have seen that uh, most groups or all the groups interviewed pointed out the social risks, citing issues as rising crime rate and um, issues of not getting married in time leading to other social problems. But what I would like to point out more importantly is the economic risk, which um, if you look at this at this right here section, you see that the private sector highlighted the economic risks for the country more than uh, the, the university directors and the government representative really didn't see unemployment, particularly youth unemployment, as a, an economic risk. And I find this very interesting for interpretation in terms of the people who are putting forth the policies and the people who are really enforcing these policies um, do not see this as an economic problem for the country. Next, um, we looked at the response and who is really responsible um, for mitigating this youth unemployment problem. And just like we expected traditionally, the government was pointed out as central to um, addressing the youth unemployment crisis in the country. However, it was really interesting that most participants addressed the, the um, university role. And this role was divided into three classifications, a strategic role, a tactical role, and an operational role. And in terms of strategic roles, I'll just give you a brief idea. People would talk about the role the university has to play beyond preparing people for the labor market. It is really preparing, I think like Dr. Mukdesi pointed out, people for the for, you know, good citizenships and t teaching tolerance and educating the society from just gen general knowledge, not just you know, matching the skills with the labor market demands. Um, another role that was highlighted was the tactical role, which is also very significant for the university. And this is, um, this is where it becomes the university plays the role of agenda setting and connecting, it, you know, make, creating connections among universities and, and within the labor market itself. And finally, um, the operational role looks at what the university does really on the ground in terms of creating entrepreneurial models um, for their students and teaching entrepreneurial skills and doing internships. Um, one of the findings that I would like to uh, also point out, and I find this really significant, is the level of awareness that we found with the university presidents and the government officials and labor market representatives. And what we tried to do right here is really place the uh, participants and the senior uh, leadership people on a continuum ranging from not aware of the crisis so they are not aware that there is really a youth unemployment crisis, to situationally aware, defining this by what programs or efforts they are doing to address this, to a, a very interesting group, which is the action-oriented um, action awareness. And this action-oriented awareness group goes a step beyond situationally aware because they take actions that are not just limited to having job fairs on campus or um, you know, teaching, doing resume uh, sessions for their students. They do things that are beyond that. And this was a very small uh, group that did that. Um, basically, 20% of the participants addressed the entrepreneurship um, issue. Really, in terms of numbers, just a few universities uh, that could be easily counted on one hand, as we say in Arabic, um, that really would cite issues or say the word entrepreneurial and teaching their students entrepreneurial skills and having these. And another example would be going to, um, it, to uh, measures that are beyond just having job fairs, such as um, having internships being mandatory for their students as they are in, the, uh, in school. So rather than wait for your students to leave school and go into the, enter the labor market, they are really helping their students enter the labor market before they leave, leave school. And I think this is very important. Um, so this brings me to a question that I would like to ask the audience today, if I may. Um, I would like to know how many university presidents or rectors or representatives of presidents are present today with us in the audience. I think we're going to wait for the answer. 
years later. Yes, I but, it's just a flower hand. <laughs> <laughs> but this, I just wanted to make a point: is that simple show of hands. Yes, the simple show of hands would have that did. But my point is, we really. I think university presidents need to be present at meetings like these because we are talking about the age group that is present in their institutions. We are addressing issues that directly impact what they are trying to do. And so I think before we jump to talking about policy reform and how we need to reform policy, we need to address policy awareness. And this is what we are really lacking um, in our, I think, in our country, Lebanon. I can speak only for Lebanon in this situation. So um, for my policy, excuse me, for my policy recommendations, I really have one strong recommendation from an institutional perspective, which is the founding of a national commission. Um, I think we need to have a five-year national commission on the role of higher education and the reduction of graduate unemployment by documenting first, by documenting the extent of the problem and keeping it visible in the media and through maintaining the national economic development and national security. I also think that we need to restructure the higher education in Lebanon by, through restructuring the universities to first be more aware of students' needs for jobs when they graduate, and they must work more closely with both governments and businesses. Um, this means revisiting the curriculum to better align it with new values. They also need to be working more closely with research and job creation in areas that are Good, uh, are a good strategic fit for Lebanon. Another aspect uh, that universities need to address is the development of data and policies that track students through their institutions and into sustained success in the workforce. When I met with the university presidents, they really didn't have any numbers or statistics to share with me about their alumni at least. I'm not talking about the national numbers, but I'm talking about alumni, and that's really troubling. Um, we, I, I strongly believe really that we really need to have a meeting to pull all these people together to focus on the role of higher education and youth unemployment mitigation. There are institutions out there that are trying to make a difference, and I think that these institutions need to be recognized and rewarded, and these universities are trying hard um, to make a difference in, in, in this youth unemployment issue. We need... Um, we need institutional restructuring to meet labor market demands and the creation of entrepreneurship models of research and development. And I think universities can have the capacity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maha. So um, to open the discussion, I think we um, are clear that uh, uh, we're looking at not just economics, we're very much looking at politics as well as policy making, I think very distinct. Um, we started with Yemen, uh, a very serious transition on the way. Yemen is the one of five countries in the world that is at the moment scheduled not to achieve any of its Millennium Development Goals, which is a very serious condemnation of what's going on, and the investments, by the way, of the international community as well as its own government. Uh, in Jordan, a new government assumes office today uh, with a wide uh, range mandate for significant political and economic reforms. In Syria, uh, the head of state came out and openly admitted the need to do more on opening up and the engagement of several parts of society as well as the social partners, employers, workers, in devising, we hope, solutions for the future. In Lebanon, despite the lack of data, and this was an interesting perception survey, uh, no shortage of multi-stakeholder analysis as you have seen and many prescriptions and I think we need to ask about the level of investment in education over centuries I think in the Arab world it looks like seems like centuries but as Brahim uh, pointed out there is a big I think dichotomy between the rhetoric and the stated objectives and the reality on the ground that is being produced so uh, moving from the what which is very important still but to the how I think is, a, is a something and I hope we'll come back in the afternoon to discussing the policy implications more. Uh, Brahim said not how much, uh, which is very important, and the opportunities, I think. This Arab Economic Summit last month, uh, one of the decisions was a $2 billion fund for youth employment. I hope that we're going to have some good advice for what to do with that money, uh, which I understand is actually available and ready to be targeted. Um, I'll take questions in sets of three. Dr. Maqdisi, I see Hanin, and one over here, and we'll continue. Thank you. Uh, I have two brief questions on a certain reverse order with Hannah. Uh, I was very pleased to, to listen to what you've said about Lebanon, Hannah, but there is one missing variable in your analysis, and this is sectarianism. I mean, you really 
put the graph there where in, in the last, since 1995, because, you know, I was deputy president of UB. I mean, I was, in fact, aware, involved in what was taking place at that time. Um, this mushrooming of the universities, in large measure, are sectarian-oriented higher institutions. Now, when you spoke about the National Commission, um, fine. I think this is, in principle, academically, that's an excellent idea to do. And they have tried it, and they have failed. The question, the reason is, of course, is our sectarian setup. So I think, I hope that you will introduce this element into your analysis in order to bring out the particularity of the Lebanese situation. You have private schools that are American-oriented, private schools that are French-oriented, and a state university whose students are perhaps the, the body is more than all the private students in, in private institutions combined. So, I mean, again, this is something which is very important. So when you want to change a curriculum in Lebanon, you are not simply talking about a purely academic educational problem. You're talking partly politics. My s question to, to Nader is, I was sort of struck by a statement you made that there has been very healthy growth in Syria, but no increase in employment. What, what, I mean, can you sort of, like a zero, zero elasticity between, between, between the two variables? I mean, is this something that you could sort of uh, expand on? Thank you. Hanin? Thank you. Thank you. Hanin Said from the World Bank. Also want to thank uh, the speakers uh, for the very uh, interesting case studies. I think um, on the one hand we are seeing uh, a lot of similarities across the countries of the region, but we're also seeing some important differences and, and maybe the, in the last session this could start to come out. But um, uh, um, uh, <coughs> uh, and, and this is irrelevant for obviously country specific uh, policy recommendations. I wanted to just pick up also on, on uh, Hannah's uh, presentation which also I found very interesting and different methodologically and the like. Um, I think, um, it, uh, and I don't know, maybe you have done it, but it is important to go a bit deeper in this analysis because just as Professor Madisi said, you have a very diverse uh, private higher education system uh, in Lebanon. <coughs> and um, my knowledge from a recent tracer study that was done by Hariri Foundation with, I think, uh, AUB and, and others, is that in fact, um, um, uh, graduate, this was a tracer study of graduates from the main universities, uh, there's very little unemployment for the top universities like AUB, USJ, uh, uh, LAU. Um, uh, the unemployment uh, uh, is hovering around uh, Lebanese university graduates and in certain disciplines only, more humanities than others. And second, among the lower tier private universities, the mom and, shop, the mom and pop shops, which have mushroomed in the past years without any system of accreditation, quality assurance uh, subjected to them uh, by, by the government. So I think the story is a bit more nuanced here about what is going on uh, in, in Lebanon in terms of actual, um, you know, graduates. But um, I'd like to hear more about what you mean by institutional. I think this wasn't a bit clear uh, whether you meant institution as a university or more institutional analysis as in the different uh, uh, decompositions of it. Very quickly, on rates of return, several speakers have mentioned, including Brahim, that um, uh, the low rates of return in the region are creating this incentive for investment in education. But actually, we haven't seen that. I mean, in terms of demand for education, particularly higher education, where uh, rates of return may be low, still very high and increasing in all of the countries. So I think it's something we need to first, in a way, to know what rates of return really represent and then understand why uh, there is still this demand for higher education regardless of what. Um, uh, a colleague about 10 years ago in the World Bank by the name of Lant Pritchett wrote a paper called uh, Where Has All That the education gone. And it was about analyzing rates of return in MENA countries. And sure, he didn't find them. But I think when we now look at what's happening in the streets and how these revolutions have started and that they started among the educated, you might want to say indeed that the rates thanks. of return are high. Can we? Thanks. Could you turn off your mics? I'm sorry. There's a young lady. Yeah. I'll just put in the green sweater. Sorry. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know your name. Hi, I'm Zena Saab. Um, I'm wondering, is there a risk to these non-democratic regimes that if they implement these major reforms that they'll lose hold on power? And if so, um, what incentive do they have to actually implement them? I think we'll stop there. That one, I don't know, we'll get an answer right away. But um, if I could ask people to, well, shall we take two more? Keith, you're okay? Well, let me take two more, actually. I have Ibrahim Awad or Hadi Al-Arabi. 
it's just uh, just a comment on something that Ibrahim Saif has said about um, discouraged workers and how to really measure. I think there are some indicators that are not taken care of. I was very glad that Mongi uh, um, mentioned a survey on job vacancies. That is very interesting to 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 uncover the question of mismatch. And there, for employment, what about employment ratio? The employment ratio would really reveal whether there is growth of employment or not. If we stick to unemployment rate, that's not sufficient. But the employment ratio will reveal whether, uh, whether uh, there really is a growth of and the question of discouraged workers would be set aside. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank those who organized this event because I think it's Mike, timely Mike, and, Mike. Sorry, and very, very useful to all of us. Um, second, uh, I really like uh, the different uh, presentation and I have been one of those who are advocating to this international organization to which I belong, uh, bring the people of the region and listen to them. And I, I wish that all of our senior management could be here to hear actually this quality of presentation, the details in which you want, but also the energy that, that is in the room, and I think it's very important. If you allow me just a few minutes to come, since we are actually uh, still in the tashkhis, diagnosis, I want to complement a few things, because this is a really a multifaceted type of problem, and we should not really confine it to the education or to growth. It's a much more multi-sectoral approach. Just to share with you a few things. I think we have to recognize that demographics in the region is a fundamental and serious issue, as Ibrahim mentioned. We cannot ignore the youth bunch, and there is no way actually to deal with it other than looking at it from a broader actually and strategic approach. Why? Because you look at different regions, and we have here the statistics. These young people of less than 29 years are almost between 15 and 20 percent in every place of the world we are at 35, 40 percent. We are double. So it's a serious issue, and it's specific to the region. The second issue I want to raise is this education issue. Education issue, yes, it's a quality issue, but in my view, it's an in inadequate policies from almost the late 70s in every and single country. And how I would qualify it? Just a few numbers to see how in our region they have also the tables and the charters that uh, illustrate it. The access to tertiary education in most of our countries used to be between 10 and 15 percent of the secondary population. We are between 60 and 85 percent. So you see the flow. While actually you have the, 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 the youth bulge, which has been growing, but at the same time we opened the schools at the tertiary to everybody, almost everybody. So the selection, the, the, the quality is there. We have been managing and investing in a quantity to please, like a type of populist uh, uh, policies, but we have never thought about the quality. So the quality is inherent in the policies that our governments actually took in place. Second, I will be very quickly. But if you look at the labor force as well, the labor force is increasing at the twice the jobs created every year in our countries. There is, there is a big mismatch. There is a flow plus the stocks which is accumulating. And we should not also ignore this. In terms of growth, investment, competitiveness, because it's fundamental, the economics of this. Investment, if you look at uh, investments in our countries and how we explain this uh, growth, because we can say it's a good growth, but in fact it is not that much high. Be why? Because two things. Investments in our countries is exactly less than the double in lack in la Latin American countries, private sector investments, so you, have, you don't have that high growth. But also in East Asia, China is around 48% of private investments. You take the highest private investment in our countries are Lebanon and Morocco. Morocco is at a 22 and uh, Lebanon is 28%. Private investments. You take public and the private, all of us will go down to less than 15% of the GDP. So investment is not, not there, etc. Now, just one thing, because it's very important to uh, uh, show, and what are the strategies that we are I fully agree with you, it's a matter of development strategy. 
if you look at where our actually have been, we have been investing and in which countries, it's very nice type of uh, graph I wanted to show you. Here, you look at where are we. Tunisia has been in low intense, low actually labor, low added value for the last 25 years. They start shifting a little bit just since 2004. Morocco, they started shifting in 1996, it's earlier, but they are still at the low, at the actually low, low added value economies. Uh, if you compare to India, China, Thailand, etc., they are at least three times the type of added value that we are creating in our economies. So you are not going to create a quality job yeah, for job. your youth. You push youth, the graduates, but your economy are mired in the low added value. And that's fundamental discrepancy in this. Now, if you look, we have been saying that FDI in our region has been increasing. There is a graph here, the yellow. It is in tourism and real estate. Forget the rest. You compare to China and the Thailand is in the high tech, high science. The, 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 the black one. So actually, the problem is there. It's really structural. It is not only the education, it's the economy on actually development Thanks, strategies. Thanks, Dr. Albi. I think if you have, that would be great to add to the number of papers that are already going to be made available to all the participants so we can all look at the list. Let me turn quickly to the panelists. Let me start with Nader. Um, okay. Um, uh, Samir's question about um, employment versus growth. Um, well, Syria had, let's say, a healthy, uh, it's a good word to use, not high. I, many people think it should have probably been higher. Uh, but it's still a healthy growth. What's happening? Not much uh, in terms of employment. We see this in other countries, in Egypt. Um, uh, to some extent, employment, unemployment is going to... To, some uh, up until a certain year was going down, but there's a lot of migration to, uh, or at least people staying in the rural areas, a lot of increase in informal sector, and not really employment, not, not really job creation. Um, in Syria, I think there's several factors. Education, there's, people are taking longer to finish their education, they're getting additional training courses to make up for the lack of skills that they developed within, or that they took on within the education system, the formal education system. Um, the female labor force participation has been going down from about 20 two percent to about fourteen percent now so uh, where, where is this going Peop young women are leaving the labor market especially in agricultural areas um, and men are taking longer to finish their schooling they're retiring earlier and they're leaving the labor force if there's someone else in the family I think we're still doing the analysis but if there's someone else in the family who's able to be the breadwinner so it's a complicated question I don't think we know all the answers I'm just putting some of the highlights in terms of what we think is happening um, I think just briefly about Hanin's returns to education. Um, higher education, to some extent, gives you options. Uh, people who finish university are more able to migrate to get jobs in the Gulf and overseas. So people still want that higher education, I think, because it gives you greater access to greater opportunities, even if it's not necessarily higher wages in the country. So th uh, there's something there to it still. Just to pick up on, um, on Nader's answers, it's still the probability on, on returns on education, the probability of being employed uh, uh, is uh, in Jordan, uh, probably in other countries, uh, is much higher when you are educated more than when you are not educated. So actually, even with low return on education, still you're working on the probability uh, option that you might uh, enter the labor market, plus, you know, the potential to migrate or others. So, so that only that way we can explain the continuous uh, demand and, uh, on, on, on education, plus actually other social factors that we cannot deny, you know, being highly educated um, in the country. And um, on, uh, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Awad on, on, yes, we might uh, uh, now start uh, searching for these vacancies uh, in, in, in job. And probably we should remember uh, those who uh, won the uh, Nobel Prize laureate. Actually, I think it, it was this mismatch between the jobs that is being created and those who are looking for the jobs and this kind of uh, 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 mismatch that uh, makes it uh, difficult. Just two quick notes on the, we've been talking about education. I really would like, and I think that word is also used uh, by, by Nader, about employability. Let's think about also education and introduce the word flexibility also. I mean, you are educated, you are not ready for that kind, particular kind of jobs, 
but with minimum with probably some additional trainings that that could make you you know so we should also uh, think about education flexibility and responding to uh, the emerging uh, job uh, opportunities uh, in the labor market but clearly i think part of the problem in the labor market it's actually between uh, i would say not economists and politicians but be between realists and politicians politicians are after quick solutions, quick fixing, quick wins, because that would make the public perception about them looks good. Uh, while, uh, uh, let me show now, economists probably see it in, as a long term, because this has been accumulated over decades. Now you cannot really fix the demand and supply in the labor market, you know, uh, as, as quickly as politicians want, and I think it's that balance that also needs to be created. Thanks. We'll save Justin for the second round. I think if Maha would like to answer. It's okay. Um, I, I will first start addressing Dr. Maktisi's question in terms of sectarianism and what risks this brings forth to the um, situation at hand when we discuss it in the commission that I'm suggesting. I think um, a very important thing to think about when we are talking about the National Commission is um, unless you have teeth, you cannot bite. So unless this commission has a certain uh, mechanism designed into it, it cannot really make a difference, um, regard, even you know, taking into consideration all the sectarianism and the other issues that are in the country. So I think what needs to be done is really a kind of a context analysis before we have this commission. And, in this, and during this context analysis, it's then that we try to design um, its enforcement capacity and design and take into consideration all these issues that are surrounding um, not just the National Commission, but mostly everything in our country um, into consideration in the design of this commission. Um, in regards to um, the deeper analysis that needs to probably go into, I, I totally acknowledge this point, and I think that this point that Hanin raises is beyond the scope of this specific study. I think this is something would be very interesting to look into and go forth um, into studying this issue, but at this point, it's beyond the, uh, the scope of this study. Um, and somebody asked in terms of what institutions, um, I'm, I'm particularly talking about just universities, and we looked at universities as defined by the Ministry of Education and Higher Education in Lebanon. So we went directly to the ministry and we took what they believed or are licensed as universities, and this is where we are coming from. Thank you. Great. Very much. Uh, Hannah, I have three more requests for the floor. If people don't mind, I'll... The lady in the black sweater. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Thank you. My name is Leila Zubaydi. Um, I have a question for um, Ms. Rali. Um, from an institutional perspective, do you also include the affordability of higher, higher education in Lebanon as a factor? I mean... Um, I work for a German institution and we, we provide uh, scholarships for, for Lebanese students to go to Germany and pursue education there. And we have a lot of very gifted applicants who say that it's still cheaper for them to learn German, to travel to Europe, to cover their living expenses in Germany, in a country that's foreign to them, and to study there with uh, uh, low tuition, than to pursue higher education in their own country. And of course, this, I mean, if they have already stayed five, four years, uh, six years in Germany, they are also very likely to, to take a job there. Um, a question to Mr. Qabani. Um, you mentioned that Syria is in transition to a social market economy. Now, from the background of, of, of the government, of course, it makes sense to call it social market economy. But in terms of policies, I really don't see where the social comes from. I mean, where are indicators that this is also in relation to what Mrs. Rali said about the youth bulge later turning into an age bulge and people into need for, for a social safety net? And uh, Ibrahim, <laughs> I have a question to you also. You mentioned that um, official numbers are actually mostly mentioning narrow unemployment, that is, official job seekers. Now then I guess, I mean, if you really look at, at, at male and female job seekers, my guess would be that female job seekers are much lower, the rates are much lower than male job seekers, so that actually the, the numbers are much more distorted when it comes to the gender discrepancy, right? Then, I mean, the, the higher female unemployment is probably even much, much higher than the male employment than this discrepancy that we see in the f official numbers, right? Thanks very much. Maha. Thank 
Maha Yahya, uh, Regional Advisor of Social Policy at ESQUA. I have actually uh, two sort of comments um, slash questions to the panel. One is on the issue of higher education and uh, this issue of criteria of how, I mean, what is the criteria by which these institutes of higher, this is not just particular to Lebanon, but it's actually across the region. We have institutes of higher education mushrooming across the region. Um, who are they catering to? what's the criteria, what kind of, uh, what is it that they're teaching, uh, for what labor market, I mean, I think these are all issues that need to be uh, put on the table, which also brings into question the issue of critical thinking and approaches to education, and it links up to, I think, the point that Brahim raised about the flexibility. There was a, research, a recent research or article I read recently, I think in the, it was in The Economist, about how people change careers at least three times in their lifetime, and so we need need to look at this issue of how do we train people, how do we, and I think this is what uh, pr fundamentally uh, higher education should give you the skills um, for you to be able to make these kinds of transitions and perhaps not only higher education but different kinds of educational systems should at least give you the, the, the technical and the, 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 uh, the intellectual skills, um, the culture of being able to change jobs uh, without falling through the cracks. And the third issue I want to raise is the connection of the, the issue of the working poor, which we're not focusing a lot on. Um, the working poor often in many of the countries we're looking at are penalized in the sense that because they work, they are blocked out of access to a lot of other social protection and social support systems. I know, for example, this is very much the case in Jordan. Um, so there's a, there's, because they're not in the unemployment kind of uh, range, they're ignored. And I think perhaps this is a sector of the population that we need to be uh, looking at, focusing on, looking at how to invest in terms of, uh, you know, enhancing their skills and getting them out of the poverty cycle. Thank you. Thanks very much. We're dipping into lunchtime. I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair to complete this round and then give the panelists time. But please, please be brief, very brief. Wafa. Yeah, Wafa. Thank you all for your um, valuable presentations. Um, I'd, uh, actually, I'd like to go back to a point that was raised by Nada on uh, the import of foreign labor. How, what role does the import of foreign labor play in the rising unemployment specifically among the, um, the youth? And um, if it does have um, a huge impact, why has there been no change in the structure, the educational structure? Thank you. Again, uh, my name is Wafia, and um, I have two majors, in fact, chemistry and business, so I'm not... Uh, I'm not uh, interfering here, you know. <laughs> okay, uh, studies have found that Arabs are very successful entrepreneurs in the USA, and they concluded that uh, the failures we have in the Arab world are caused by the environment. So our genes are not to blame for uh, the unemployment which we are uh, facing. Uh, now, I, have, I can identify two causes for the problems we have with unemployment uh, in the Middle East. First, that in Lebanon, for example, young people are too proud to take certain jobs, whereas when they go to the West, uh, they don't mind washing dishes or becoming waiters or uh, becoming cashiers at gas stations. So it's the culture to blame, you know, in, in this respect. Another thing uh, I can identify is that uh, we spoil our kids in, in, in Lebanon. Uh, you know, at first I used to condemn the fact that in the West they force the kids out when they turn 18, but now I can see uh, that there is an advantage to this because they become independent and responsible and they start, you know, aiming to succeed at a very young age. So I think we, we need to change this, this culture of spoiling them and pampering them until they turn 40 sometimes. Uh, Zafiris, I see Zafiris in the back, and I'm going to take one here, and we're going to call it a wrap, I think. Okay, and UNDP, one. Sorry, I don't have a microphone. Well, thanks very much, the speakers and uh, the people who, who their questions enriched uh, uh, the directions. Uh, 
And I have two questions, and I would like to ask the panel. Yeah, thank you. Is this on? Yeah, thank you. I would like to ask the panel, how would the analysis and recommendations would change if the question, the first question was posed, that we don't have too many youth, but we have too few jobs. In all other regions, they took advantage of the demographic window of opportunity, including West Europe after the war and East Asia during the golden years. The region is failing to take advantage of that. I think the conclusion is there are no jobs here. It's not that we have too many youth. So how would you approach this question? The second question is, do we have high youth unemployment? The answer is yes. The region has the highest youth unemployment in the world. But the region has the highest unemployment in the world. So the problem in the region is not youth unemployment. It's unemployment which is, takes us back to the demand for labor. And so far I hear a lot for employment funds for the youth and education. This is on the supply side. The supply side, if successful, will send more Arab people to the US and to the OECD. And there the people have the skills and they can excel, but they cannot excel here. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Neat with the Council for British Research on the Levant in Damascus. Uh, firstly, as an aside, I've never met anyone in Europe who is kicked out by their parents when they hit 18. <laughs> And I think actually we have many of the same problems. Younger people stay at home for longer amounts of time in Europe and in the US as well. So this is a worldwide problem of youth unemployment. It's not something simply which is confined to the Arab world. Um, but the point I wanted to make was about the role of higher education. And I think we need to be more realistic about how exactly universities can help contribute to youth um, employability. Um, Firstly, I mean, a lot of emphasis being placed on critical thinking in particular, which of course is extremely important, but I wonder if the rise, the economic rise of China, Japan, the East Asian economies was also built on critical thinking. I don't think it was. Um, so there are different ways to get there. Perhaps people simply aren't memorizing the right things. Um, the other point I wanted to make is about, I think there's a real risk to... I mean, universities, universities are there to teach and to do research. I think it becomes problematic if we start to train people from the job market. This is something that's happening very rapidly in the UK um, in particular, where we have to, uh, you know, we're judged on how employable our graduates are. Uh, I don't think universities are very well placed for that. And I was also surprised in your presentation, Hannah, which I found very interesting, that the, the thing you highlighted as being the best practice was the universities which trained people to become entrepreneurs, which seems to me to be a very small element of this puzzle. I'm not particularly sure that entrepreneurship is something you can teach anyway. Um, and I don't know, I mean, to me, you know, it's, it's such a small part of the puzzle. I don't think it's the broader answer. So I just wanted to throw that out there, sticking up for the, for the universities. <laughs> بسرعة بالنسبة للعلاقة ما بين الفقر والبطالة هناك بشكل عام ملاحظة عامة بتقول انه ليس هناك علاقة بين الفقر والبطالة وهذه بعتقد هناك نحن ونحن بحاجة لدراسة معمقة او لعادة نظر بهذا الموضوع وخاصة بشكل مختصر انه الحقيقة الفقر اللي عم نقيسه هو بيبين مش الفقر بيبين فقر خطوط الفقر التي نقيس بها وعندما ترتفع خطوط الفقر نجد علاقة وطيدة ما بين الفقر والبطالة في العالم العربي فهذه ملاحظة أولى ملاحظة الثانية فيما يخص لبنان حول علاقة الجامعات في سوق العمل بعتقد بحاجة نحن كذلك لإعادة النظر بما يعني سوق العمل في لبنان يعني 60% على الأقل من الناس الذين يحصلون على دراسة جامعية يعملون خارج لبنان وبالتالي السؤال هو الجامعات التي الموجودة في لبنان هل هي موجهة لسوق عمل محلي أم لسوق عمل مهجري وهذه مسألة أساسية وبالتالي تعيد النظر في آلية التعليم وأهداف التعليم ومعناه في لبنان من ناحية أخرى لما نقول عندما نقول أن 60% من المتخرجين من الجامعات يعملون خارج لبنان هذا يعني أن البطالة نفسها في لبنان أرقام البطالة إلى آخره يجب أن نفكر فيها أخذا بعين الاعتبار الهجرة والخط الذي وضعتيه بالنسبة من 15 ل 60 يقل البطالة إذا وضعنا خطه وجربنا هذا الشيء الهجرة نجد أن هناك خطا موازيا صاعدا بالنسبة للهجرة ولا 
اخيرا مسألة ولو سمحتي بالنسبة لسوريا اضافة للشيء اللي قالته ليلى حول مسألة السوشيال ماركت السوق الاجتماعي بعتقد لازم نعيد النظر قليلا بلغة الخشب تبع الانظمة ونقول الانتقال واكثر من لغة الخشب السؤال هو هل نحن ان كان في سوريا او في مصر او في في تونس انتقلنا من ستيت كنترولد ماركت لسوشيال ماركت او لا او لا ماركت بشكل عام او لسوق يحكمه الاحتكار مجموعة احتكارية هذه مسألة اساسية الى تبعات اقتصادية وتبعات فيما يخص العمل وبالتالي هذه مسألة يجب التفكير فيها ما معنى هل هناك سوق فعليا في مصر مثلا ام هناك سوق يحتكره مجموعة من رعاة الاقتصاد والسياسي وهذه مسألة إلى تبعات شكرا we could go on for a very long time and we will over lunch a light lunch that is going to be served outside in just a few minutes but let me ask the panelists to take two minutes each please for some final thoughts شكرا أنا أجري with ليلى that numbers could be much more distorted than they look and this is when I presented, I focus on the illiterate, on the illiterate uh, unemployment amongst illiterate females, which is extremely low. It's simply because it's not uh, accounted for in, in the figure. So, so I, uh, I, I must um, uh, agree on that. And on the, yes, actually also, that's quick telegraphic flexibility in the labor market. I think, yes, it goes in hand in hand with, this, with the safety net, actually, with the social safety net or the employment benefits that could be installed so you can uh, allow for some time to, for adaptability uh, in that sense. So we should look also employ, uh, labor market and social policies uh, uh, at the same uh, time. Uh, and on the question on the foreign labor and its impact on the youth, I think this, this needs to be, well, in the case of Jordan at least, the number of uh, foreign laborers in, in, in Jordan is even higher than the number of unemployed. But that does not mean that there is a perfect match between the jobs created or the uh, jobs available and the, uh, it's actually those unemployed, those are unemployed, skills, uh, uh, not skilled. So, but also adopting a flexible, uh, very flexible labor market policies in terms of opening the labor market to endless supply, even sometimes puts the nationals at uh, a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the uh, foreign laborers. But uh, uh, at the, in, in the case of Jordan, that match is not uh, yet created, and that we can go and talk about the labor, uh, the, the, um, the working conditions uh, th that comes with the foreign labor of abuse, of uh, working hours, and etc., etc., that really puts sometimes uh, youth uh, at uh, disadvantage. Uh, uh, I just, uh, the virus, uh, I will escape the first uh, question, but the second, I think it is, uh, at least in Jordan, it is uh, a youth phenomenon, unemployment in, in Jordan. It is a youth phenomenon. It's not, there is a high unemployment, but if you look at the, the, the age groups, 15 to 29, they make most of the unemployed uh, in Jordan. And I don't think that we can uh, actually, uh, just to respond to uh, Marwan, um, I don't think that we can really uh, uh, reform education to serve one country. I think we should focus on the, on the issue of uh, skills acquisition and employability in general, whether it's for Lebanon, for Jordan, for other countries. This is something that you really equip the people to be able to adapt to a new environment. Thanks. Uh, just reacting to a couple of points. Um, I think on the whole debate of the role of uh, um, tertiary education in preparing uh, young people for the labor market. I do think that this is an underexplored and an underinvested um, area of work. And I think intentionally or unintentionally in the region, um, tertiary education is being used as some form of pressure release valve to put off um, solving the problem of finding young people jobs. Um, so I think an investment in this, uh, in tertiary education to understand how they could be part of a solution to uh, the employment question is needed unless we're looking at, at, at the tertiary education system uh, just being an, uh, an incubator for empowering young people to protest, whether that's a good or a bad thing. 
Um, and then secondly, I think uh, Maha's point about working poor, I think that's very valid. Uh, and I think looking at, at solutions that do exist in the region uh, for empowering and transitioning working poor uh, to become uh, full participants in society and able to, 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 to move up the economic rung is, is critical. And looking at uh, microenterprises is, is one of the solutions for that because the majority of working poor, for example, in Yemen and other countries, uh, are basically necessity entrepreneurs, that they are surviving through entrepreneurial activities. Um, and intentionally targeting working poor um, through um, structured access to finance, uh, structured uh, non-financial support processes that help them formalize, access other forms of finance like savings. These are critical to helping the working poor migrate onto the first rung of the economy um, and, and to help them become a more active part of, of, of society. Um, I'll also address just a, a few points that were raised. Um, first, in, in terms of the affordability of higher education in Lebanon, I think with the um increase in the, ra the rapid increase in the number of institutions in the country, I think um, the affordability of higher education doesn't, didn't, became less of an issue. Now, it, it depends on what quality of education you are targeting. If you are targeting the, um, the prestigious universities in the country, um, then this becomes an issue of affordability. But um, uh, something that we also came across in the study is that a large number of the students, student body currently in these um, new, newer universities or young universities as I would like to call them are actually working students who come to the to this classroom in the afternoon. So they're trying at the same time to pay for their own um, you know, education while they are still working. So I, I think um, an issue of affordability is, is not a big issue when you talk about the new institutions that are, are here. Um, somebody else raised the issue of the criteria for um, higher education institutions um, and if there's any kind of standardization or the quality. And this is interesting that um, the Ministry of Education and Higher Education here in Lebanon is actually trying, or at least this is what they have reported, is that they are trying to um, bring forth quality assurance. And they're working, I think they've been working for the past four years now, on a quality assurance model that can cut across the higher education institutions in the country. Um, but still, it is an issue. And we need to learn, I think we need to learn more about what are these institutions trying to address within the labor market. Um, I think for foreign labor in Lebanon, um, in, in my opinion, and there was a tracer study I think Hanin mentioned that, that was done with UNDP and AUB and several other universities. They talk about foreign labor and it's particularly unskilled in Lebanon. So it is not filling the, the, the gap of the skilled workers that are facing the youth unemployment in the country because it's mainly unskilled. Um, it, in terms of the um, culture, somebody also mentioned, uh, there were some cultural um, roots for the crisis that were mentioned in our study, and they are mainly because, uh, because there's a strong push towards having engineers and doctors and, and lawyers in the country, particularly in Lebanon, and there isn't a lot of awareness on other alternatives that can be, you know, um, that, that you can become an engineer, but an alternative kind of an engineer, etc. So I think culture does play a significant role in terms of also accepting the kind of job you are willing to accept. Um, finally, um, before I close, just two more points. Um, in terms of entrepreneurship, I strongly believe that it's not just innate. I think it has multiple aspects to it. So entrepreneurship does not, in my opinion at least, and from the, what I've read, it doesn't come only from uh, what if you are born an entrepreneur. I think you, there are a lot of issues that you can, aspects that you can learn in terms of entrepreneurship. And um, yes, I, I think I did highlight entrepreneurship, and thank you very much for pointing out that. But I, I probably did not say that this was only one aspect that was highlighted by this, and, and by this group that was um, placed within the um, action-oriented awareness. They did uh, highlight other issues, and thank you for bringing that forth so I could uh, mention that. Um, of, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you. Um, okay, I, I think there was a, a, a series of very good questions asked about the social market economy in Syria. It's going to relate to Syria, maybe other regions, but I know as countries, but I know about Syria. So I, I for one, see evidence of seriousness um, and interest. Um, the key issue is really building the capacity to be able to to conceive, design, and implement um, these reforms. Um, uh, I, I know that we're running out of time. Uh, so, but, um, in terms of the serious thing, I think uh, young people, um, it takes them months and years to find a job, 
for our vacancies, it takes us months and years to find qualified people. Um, so I think all I'm saying is that I think there's two, there's two issues that are both important, the, the issues of jobs and the issues of skills. And I think discounting one or the other uh, doesn't do the issue justice. So that's it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for your time and patience. A very timely discussion. Thanks again to Carnegie for convening us. Thanks to the panelists, and you're all invited to lunch outside. <laughs>